in the 1920s, following on from the developments of Cubism and Futurism, ideas circulated in Europe regarding the significance of a sense of movement in modern art. In 1920, Naum Garbo and Antoine Pevner proclaimed, and I quote, we affirm in these plastic and pictorial arts a new element, the kinetic rhythms, as the basic forms of our perception of real time. And in 1922, Laszlo Moholy-Nagy stated that artists must, and I quote, put in place um, the static principle of put in place the static principle of classical art, the dynamic principle of universal life. In Britain, following the experiments of the vorticists and the interim of the First World War, artists, and sculptors in particular, sought a way of working that expressed something of the dynamism of their age. In this short paper, I want to compare the different trajectories of two sculptors in the 1920s, Frank Dobson and Henry Moore, as a means to explore the subtle change in how movement was conceptualised in both theory and practice over the course of the decade, and I hope it will sort of follow on quite well from some of the questions that were coming up after your paper, Cathy. Um, I will argue that the artists' uh, respective experiences in the city during this period informed their approaches to art, and that two commissions completed towards the end of the decade served to demonstrate their divergent paths. Um, it's worth saying a few words about the different experiences the two sculptors had growing up. So Frank Dobson was born in 1886, so 12 years older than Moore, um, and his childhood was fa fairly peripatetic, spent in London, um, in Hampstead, Good Street, Forest Gate, and Brighton. Um, aged 11, Dobson won a scholarship to Leighton Technical School and following the death of his father, he moved to Hastings to live with an aunt and attended the Hastings School of Art. Um, he worked as a studio assistant to the sculptor William Reynolds Stevens, but at that time he wasn't actually um, creating any sculpture himself. Um, he spent time in Cornwall and Devon before being awarded a scholarship to the Hospital Field Art Institute in Arbroath in Scotland in 1906. Four years later, in 1910, he returned to London and attended the City and Guilds Art School in Kennington before returning to Cornwall. In 1915, Dobson enlisted in the artist's rifles and was posted to France, but was sent back to England in 1917 with an ulcer and invalided out in November 1918. Shortly afterwards, Dobson moved into Trafalgar Studios, Manresa Road in Chelsea, um, which was his address until 1939. And I, I won't go into detail about Moore's upbringing because I'm sure you're all very familiar, but suffice to say that Dobson's um, upbringing was sort of fairly unstable in comparison to Moore's with the sort of solid backing of um, his teachers, his secondary school and his family. Um, Moore, of course, moved to London in 1921 to attend the Royal College of Art. Dobson's first experience of modern art was at the Glasgow Institute where they were taken from hospital fields, so sort of in the period 1906 to 1910. And there he recalls seeing a Monet and a Pissarro. Later in London, Dobson saw, and I quote, a large collection of Impressionist pictures at the Franco-British exhibition at Shepherd's Bush. And he also saw Roger Fry's uh, post-Impressionism show at the Grafton Galleries. Um, of that show, he stated in retrospect, I quote, um, post-Impressionism awakened me from my enchanted dream. The show at the Grafton Galleries was just an explosion, the demolition of all the art forms I had come to know. Despite his enthusiasm, he described Cezanne and Van Gogh as too complex at that time, but the style and sculptural qualities of the paintings by Gauguin prompted Dobson to visit the British Museum to study non-Western sculpture, including Peruvian, Egyptian, Assyrian, Polynesian, and African sculpture. Moore's first experience of modern art, as we heard, um, came via his art teacher, Alice, Alice Gostick, um, and also in the home of Michael Sadler, um, Sadler the vice chancellor of the university. Um, when in London, Moore began his frequent visits to the British Museum um, on Wednesday and Sunday afternoons. Both Dobson and Moore recall specific books which inspired them in their early life. Um, in the 1910s, uh, Dobson met uh, Guy Baker in Cornwall and borrowed books on Cézanne, Van Gogh and Gauguin. Um, and in a lecture um, given in 1951 at the Royal Academy, Dobson also sort of talking um, about the his early life mentions um, Antony Ludovici's Nietzschean art, um, which ultimately prompted him to study Egyptian and archaic Greek sculpture. He also cites two magazines which introduced him to Expressionism in the 1910s, the German titles Jugend and Simplissimus, which was a satirical magazine. By the 1920s in London, Dobson had clearly gathered a library of his own, as is evidenced in the diary of Betty Muntz, which um, I was fortunate to look at in the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. Um, she was Dobson's studio assistant um, in the early 1920s, and on the 30th of October 1920, she writes, 
Dobby showed me some books on sculpture and lent me a beautiful Egyptian one. He showed me a book of the work of some German woman. It was awfully good, most of it. Um, obviously, for more, it's Fry's vision and design, which is often cited as pivotal in influencing his understanding of modern art, a book he read in Leeds in 1921. And as Rob mentioned the morning, after he sort of came back from his very traditional learning at the Royal College of Art, he was able to sort of pour over the books in his own bedroom. And he recalls, and I quote, it was heaven in the evenings in my horrid little room in Sydney Street when I could spread out the books I'd got out of the library and know that I had the chance of learning about all the sculptures that had ever been made in the world. In addition to the college library, in his first autumn term, Moore discovered Zvema's bookshop on Charing Cross Road. And um, to sort of fully um, give details of the quote that Rob referred to th this morning, he said, no doubt the British Museum contributed most of all to my great excitement and education, but the art books I found in Zwemmers had a great share too. It was easy to combine weekly visits with call-ins at Zwemmers. These calls would sometimes quite shamelessly last an hour. So both artists in their formative years recall the impact of particular publications, access via informal connections or in libraries and new specialist bookshops in the city. Images of historic and contemporary art circulated freely when the real thing was not always available to see. And R.H. Walensky writes um, that in the modern era, and I quote, the continuous publication, publication in books, periodicals, and as separate sheets of countless photographs of sculpture of all times and places had made it easy for every student to obtain some contact with a hundred kinds of sculpture in an afternoon. For Dobson and Moore, the society that they kept in London in the 1920s proved to be influential in relation to their ongoing education, their commissions and sales, but also in relation to their opportunity for travel. Dobson had been lucky to count Augustus John as an early champion, and by the beginning of the 1920s, he was fettered by fashionable London society, including um, the critics, Clive Bell and Roger Fry, the economist John Maynard Keynes, um, the writers David Garnett and Raymond Mortimer and Osbert and Sackreville Sitwell, Sitwell. He'd been introduced to this company, the sort of Blooms Group, via Stephen Tomlin, who was a younger artist affiliated with that circle, um, who was a private student of Dobson's. Uh, Mortimer ended up writing a book on Dobson, which was published by the Fleuron Press in 1926, and Fry wrote about Dobson in the Burlington magazine and Bell in Vogue. Um, when people are discussing these sort of early uh, write-ups of Dobson, they appear sort of over-enthusiastic in retrospect, considering the sort of long-term trajectory of his um, career. Dobson was to do many portraits of that circle, such as the Osbert Sitwell and also the Lydia Lepakova. Further afield, through his role as a founder member on the Council of the Film Society in London, Dobson travelled to France and met Man Ray and Alice Print, better known as Kiki de Mont Montparnasse. He recalls, and I quote, I was very much excited about the cinema and in Paris had gone to see some rather intellectual films and because of this interest I was asked to go on the council of the newly formed film society. One of the first things I did for the society was to go to Paris and get an abstract film by Man Ray. So that's a still from Emmet Recchio, which is likely the film. The film society crowd was viewed as rather unorthodox with a writer in the Daily Express describing the scene outside the cinema at one of their screenings. I quote... I found the pavement of the Strand crowded with the most diverse and peculiar collection of people I have seen in London. A good many had no hats, but they were to make up for that because between them they had a quite astonishing number of hairy chins. <laughs> Plus fours, queer-coloured flannel trousers and immaculate morning coats were inextric inextricably jumbled. But evidently Dobson appeared quite at home, as the reporter continues. The first person I saw inside had a Slavonic face, admirably suited to the occasion. It was Mr Frank Dobson, the sculptor. In Paris in 1922, Dobson saw an exhibition of Picasso's work and also met Zadkin. Um, Travelling again to the city in 1926, um, he recalls seeing the work of Durand, Matisse, Citrillo, Marie Laurencin and Suzanne Valandon. Um, he recalls, and I quote, I spent quite a lot of time visiting the galleries and various exhibitions on the left bank and also the Rue de la Bertisse. I used to sit outside the dome or the rotonde discuss discussing the latest developments of the masters. There were all sorts of young students about. Other famous figures he encountered during subsequent visits to France include Jean Cocteau, Peggy Guggenheim, and her husband Laurence Vail. And in 1924, the, work, the year Dobson's work was included in the Biennial, um, he travelled to Venice with Leo and Elsie Myers. 
Leo Myers was one of the founders of the London Artists Association, of which Dobson was a member. And so this was a time of economic uncertainty in Britain, and this organisation had been formed um, and paid selected artists a wage in exchange for a commission on the sale of work. So you sort of in this sort of select circle where some sort of income was assured. Um, Myers also invited Dobson to accompany him on a trip to Sri Lanka, where they went by boats in 1925. <laughs> So the picture we get of Dobson during this time is an artist sort of thoroughly embedded within avant-garde of London, but also Europe, and absorbing a wide range of materials, so painting sculpture, but also film and non-Western art. As a student in London in the same period, Moore's experience is perhaps understandably less cosmopolitan by comparison. Um, we've heard about his peers, Raymond Cox and Edna Genesi and Barbara Hepworth, um, and he sort of mentions anecdotally meeting sort of some people via William Rothenstein and also Charles Robertson, which um, Rob mentioned this morning. In Paris in 1922, when he was there with Raymond Coxon, he notes seeing the Cezanne in the Pellerin collection and describes the great bathers approvingly as the triangular bathing composition with the nudes in perspective, lying on the ground as if they'd been sliced out of mountain rock. And it was interesting to see how Moore uses a similar composition of trees in his own two nudes among trees although this was made a year earlier, but circa date makes me wonder whether it does have some relation with the Cezanne. But he doesn't appear to have been as impressed when visiting Paris again in 1925 as part of his travelling scholarship, during which time he also visited Rome, Florence, Venice and other cities in Italy. He wrote to Raymond Coxon, and I quote, You were right about Paris. It's a dull hole. Nothing of any great interest seems to be going on, and the place hasn't the variety of London. A week is enough. <laughs> So, in comparison with Dobson, Moore appears to have shewed much of the artistic activity in London and Paris, perhaps in favour of a more subjective pursuit of art. A crucial feature in the modern city is, of course, technology, and the way in which Dobson and Moore refer to technology helps us understand their developing artistic positions. Speaking with Stanley Casson about his motivation for wanting to pursue sculpture, Dobson revealed, and I quote, I've always loved to mess about with engines and such things, and I've got this longing to always work in three dimensions and use my fingers and hands. So automatically I found myself taking to modelling and carving. That's how I became a sculptor. Moore, on the other hand, recollects, whilst a student at the Royal College of Art, I became involved in machine art, which in those days had its place in modern art. Although I was interested in the work of Leger and the futurists who exploited mechanical forms, I was never directly influenced by machinery as such. And we were talking about this quote. He's referring to the stringed forms, but um, it sort of seems to have a wider impact. So while Dobson explicitly links mechanics with handiwork and sculpture, more distances the relation, preferring to associate machines with an aesthetic and a historic one at that. So. Observers of Dobson's work often refer to a certain rhythmic quality. Fellow artist Cedric Morris, for instance, writes of Dobson's sculpture Manchild, which is in the exhibition, and I hope you all saw it at lunch. Here, one is at once struck by the rhythm, a quality very rare but belonging to all good sculpture, and fullness and roundness of the form or forms used. The constancy and fitting together of the forms, the curious flowing, almost writhing quality of the lines, giving this piece of work a liveliness added to its great solidity and weightfulness. And of, this is another work by Dobson, Woman Descending from a Bus. This piece of work has a sensation of turning or swinging around slowly and shows again this rhythm and flowing quality. The obvious reference for this sculpture reproduced very poorly here, this is an online scan of issue number two of Wyndham Lewis's The Tyro, is... Duchamp's new descending a staircase, and I love the incredibly prosaic homage of Dobson's title, uh, Woman Descending from a Bath. <laughs> so the movement in these and other works by Dobson is akin to a freeze frame or a multiple exposure showing the path of bodies in motion. As Dobson explained to Stanley Casson when interviewed in 1933, all the finest works in sculpture which I have seen have a peculiar still quality which I call static, Underlying this, the forms, or the multiple of them, are assembled in such a fashion that one is aware of a continuous and beautiful movement within the whole, which I like to call rhythm. One limb is given a fullness which leads up to another shape, which is its complement, and so, as you pass round, you observe the unity of the artist's intention. From this description, one gets a sense of progression of form over time and a succession of states 
and it's the time-based media of music with which Dobson drew an analogy when discussing his work in 1936. He states, Rhythm and flow in sculpture are to me much the same as they are in music. There are staccato passages where a movement is quick and jerky, and there are big crescendos where the volume swells with big and simple resonance. And it's by the subtle relation of these that much of the finest results are achieved. If Dobson's sense of movement is to be understood in terms of kinetics, informed by an interest in music, cinema, and mechanics, and resulting in a sculpture of stilled rhythms, then Moore's, from an ostensibly comparable beginning, is understood in quite different terms by the end of the decade. Early sketches show Moore, like Dobson, exploring the body in motion. And you can also see this in the lino cut, which is upstairs, and in various designs for freezers. The designs sort of also relate to, you know, some of Moore's very early work with the, the sort of pots, which are often talked about in terms of a proto-cinema because you can sort of turn them and create this sort of animation of forms. Early carvings, such as Standing Woman, appear to have a lot in common with Dobson's rhythmic portrayal of the human body, and more even depicted a dance scene. Nevertheless, looking back on the period in 1982, Moore stated... And I quote, I did not and I still do not like sculpture that represents actual physical movement. By the 1930s, more sculpture had become characteristic in its solidity, combined with a sense of growing or surging forms, as in the 1930 Reclining Woman in Blue Horton Stone or the Half Figure in Ancaster Stone from the same year. And Moore preferred to describe his works in terms of a living energy in the 1930s. So his statement for the Unit 1 catalogue, Moore explains, for me, a work must have a vitality of its own. I do not mean a reflection of the vitality of life, of movement, physical action, frisking, dancing figures, and so on, but that a work can have it in it a pent-up energy and an intense life of its own, independent of the object it might represent. He states that his aim was to, and I quote, turn an inert block into a composition which has a full-form existence, with masses of varied size and section conceived in the air surrounded entirety, stressing and straining, thrusting and opposing each other in spatial relationship, being static and yet having an alert, dynamic tension between its parts. Edward Euler has described in detail how the myriad discoveries in the life sciences in the 1920s and 30s, in particular biology, and their dissemination via popular literature, photography and cinema, may be observed to have informed the approach of artists interested in doctrines of truth to materials or neo-romanticism. He cites Moore as an exemplary figure in such a discussion, and early writers on Moore, such as Geoffrey Grigson, describe, and I quote, that life, that held in immense life, is Moore's interest. He is interested in the rounded, solid shapes into which life builds itself. In the British Museum, he had seen the carved symbols of life. He now saw life in its natural forms and framework, from the cells to the skeleton. So despite having begun the decade in a mode that was comparable to that of Dobson, by the end of the 1920s, for more, the objective was to imbue the material used with a vitality that expressed the dynamism of the modern era, not directly, representationally, but in oblique terms, by the recognition of the teeming structures of life that lie beyond the human eye. We can see the variance in the two sculptors' approaches neatly in two commissions they produced towards the end of the decade for architectural settings. On the one hand, Dobson's, which served to illustrate the ideas for which he was to achieve most public recognition in his career. On the other, Moore's, which I think was formative, the means by which he shared elements of his earlier work and consolidated the approach to sculpture that would yet bring him the greatest success. Dobson's was a relief for the head office of the Hayes Wharf Companies on the south bank of the River Thames, and that's a sort of recent photo, you can see it there, on a building designed by Harry Stewart Goodhart Rendell. Dobson responded to the commission with a work on the theme of commerce, capital and labour, represented by three figures at the top of the relief, from which descend four lines of sequentially composed panels showing geometrically simplified boxes, barrels, canisters, stacked and linked with ropes or chains. The panels are gilded and framed with black granite on the facade of the building. The commission was reviewed favourably in the press, with one reviewer reluctantly admitting... The effect is as pleasing as it is startling, and even the distortions of the crowning figures, bewildering in themselves, are justified when considered in relation to the geometrical forms of the other panels. And the architectural correspondent of the Times enthused, no praise can be too high for Mr Dobson's treatment of the reliefs, 
The planes of the details have been so skillfully adjusted to the play of light and shade that the design is clear and coherent as a whole. From London Bridge, the details tell rather like hieroglyphics, and on a nearer approach, they're full of interest. The work precisely combines Dobson's interest in rhythm, with the linked reliefs even forming something akin to a film strip as they run the length of the facade. It combines both geometric forms that recall cubism and a figurative approach. Though it was received successfully, it perhaps marked the moment at which Dobson began to be accepted by the traditionalists. By the end of the 1920s, he was no longer the unstable character reviewed in the press and outside the film society screenings, and also that caused him to be rejected by Rothenstein as a candidate for the position of head of sculpture at the Royal College of Arts in 1925, which was Moore's suggestion. Moore's commission, on the other hand, was a relief depicting the West Wind for the new London transport headquarters in St James and came by the architect Charles Holden. The tower of the building was to be inspired by the Tower of the Winds in Athens, and Moore was one of several sculptors asked to contribute a relief of a wind, which would be positioned above Epstein's day and night figures on the lower part of the building. What's often remarked upon is Moore's dissatisfaction of having to work in relief. Moore recalls being extremely reluctant to accept the commission and claims he was resolved to cut as deeply as the conditions would allow to suggest sculpture in the round. Writing two, just two years after the commission in the Architectural Association Journal in 1930, Moore confirms, the sculpture which moves me most is full-blooded and self-supporting, fully in the round, that is, its component forms are completely realised and work as masses in opposition, not being merely indicated by surface cutting in relief. It is not perfectly symmetrical, it is static and it is strong and vital, giving off something of the energy and power of great mountains. But these comments are in retrospect, and one could argue that it was precisely the process of working on this commission that led more to his firmly held views, and crucially also provided him with a method of producing dynamic sculpture that did not actually represent movement. The 1928 sketchbook, which you can also see in the exhibition, shows his trouble in attempting to respond to the ostensibly kinetic theme, and he wrestles the figure through myriad formulations. These are just photocopies from the sort of catalogue raisonné, so sorry for the quality. His resolution came in the characterisation of the wind, the west wind, as a rainier and softer wind, and the drawings appear to develop towards a more solid, static figure, rather than one in motion. For Moore, the commission at the end of the 1920s was the shape of things to come, not the shape of things as they had been, as it was for Dobson. In the 1920s in London, then, Dobson and Moore both experienced a similar proliferation of images of modern art and modern culture via literature, museums, galleries, film, and travel abroad. While Dobson's approach was to attempt to represent this flow in rhythmic sculptural composition, Moore's approach was to assimilate the flow and seek to render the knowledge of the universal forms it produced. As a critic, R.H. Rilen Rilensky wrote, the modern sculptors have arrived at the concept of the universal analogy of form, the concept of all human, animal, and vegetable forms as different manifestations of the common principles of architecture. And again, more summarised in the Primitive Art essay, that underlying these individual characteristics, the featural peculiarities in the primitive schools, a common world language of forms is apparent. The same shapes and form relationships are used to express similar ideas at widely different places and periods in history. So in the 1930s, as Edward Euler has argued, there was, and I quote, a growing disenchantment with the fruits of industrialization and mechanization, which had served to heighten hostility towards those forms of artistic modernism, specifically geometric abstraction that appeared to cravenly mimic mechanical imagery and therefore ignore the biological needs of humankind. He identifies the decline of faith in materialism and mechanism as a meaningful epistemological system the causes of which include the reality of warfare during the First World War and post-war industrialization. This was replaced by a more romantic understanding of nature, informed by instinctive, idealistic, holistic or metaphysical attitudes, and bolstered by such notions as Henry Bergson's Ilan Vital, the idea of a dy dynamic force which motivates the growth and form of living organisms. In their engagement with a modern city in the 1920s, one can see Dobson's mechanistic modernity contrasted with Moore's increasingly more vitalist or humanist modernity. And it was with these respective ways of thinking that the sculptors were able to themselves augment the mise-en-scene of the city via commissions in the public realm that contributed to the reformation of the city in modern art terms, influencing the next generation of artists. That's the end.
That's Moore's design for a lamp, which I couldn't find a way to fit in, but it, it's very amusing. <laughs> Um, you left us tantalisingly that with this. Can I, before we get some questions, can you say a little bit more? And I've got a space to say. Well, I went why, through all of the sketchbooks, and I, I, I guess I was sort of used to this, uh, looking for the things that didn't seem to fall into Dobson's, um, sorry, Moore's um, work at all. And these were he did two designs for lamps in the sort of mid twenties, and there are two sort of candelabra sort of figures, and then the actual things that were made, he made clay models for them, which looked completely different and then were subsequently destroyed. So again, one of those, trying something out, not making it. I, <clears throat> just to follow up on this, I think that's incredibly, in terms of what you just said, um, your reading of Dobson and Moore and their versions of how they render movement and think about energy and form, and I think this is incredibly telling because at a time in the mid-1920s when artists are in the thralls of the products of technological modernity, the light bulb, um, electrics, telephones, motor cars, here we have an artist whose lamp is candles <laughs> you know, that burns down. It's, it, it talks to still life, memento mori, an old-fashioned outlook. And, you know, it's very, I think it's a very uh, telling, telling image. It also kind of just to carry on. It leads me to my first, just first question to you. Um, which is, I found your paper incredibly helpful, actually, and pennies were dropping as I was listening to you, because it's not often you hear Dobson's work talked about in relation to Moore. It's quite rare. Although we know they share the same cultural space and they've had, some, no doubt, similar thoughts and there are correspondences and shared ideas. But um, what, what, what I, in your schematic account from the late teens to the 30s, the move in the cult of Art Deco, mm -hmm. how they think about movement, vitalism in different ways, which is very clearly laid out, one of the things that come, came to my mind is looking at that Osbert sit well in 1923, mm -hmm. and thinking about the way that Henry Moore uh, harnessed the optical energies and effects of polished metal in the 1930s, I want you to say a little bit about, if I can draw you if you will, on both these artists' use of their treatment of surface. Mm -hmm. You talked about structure and about figuration and form, but how they both, in quite, often quite contradictory ways, use polished wood, polished stone even, polished metal, in ways that bespeak an art, a knowing Art Deco fad, but also talk at other moments to non-Western, to, to mm -hmm. exotic hardwoods, or to, you know, could you just sh yeah. shine polish in relation to I mechanistic mean, modernities? The sort of <clears throat> uh, Catholic approach to finishes and different types of material is something that you definitely observe in Dobson's work from the period, and also, you know, from Moore's, actually, in a, in a slightly longer period as well. And they both enjoy looking at their works in different stages, and there are sort of, you know, Dobson um, photographed work in a model form as well before having the sort of finished thing. So the dancers was one of the earlier slides, and you see that in bronze and also in clay. And those images have sort of circulated as well. So um, I think it's, yeah, so it's uh, Roger Fry's transformations actually... Uh, reproduces as a plate, and obviously this is a this is a huge important book, and there's only sort of what like 28 plates. One of them is Dobson's Cornucopia, and so it covers the whole, you know, it covers a broad history of sculpture, and it's the clay model rather than the finished piece. Um, so in terms of polish, I think for Dobson using it in the kind of 20s, it very much did link in with those ideas of technological modernity, but I think. I don't know, this is complete speculation, and I'm mm. sure there are many more, more ex experts in the room that I could um, say more decisively on this, but it seems that having that level of polish for more has a sort of slightly more... It needs a kind of meaning, a kind of inner meaning, and so it's only when he gets to the sort of the 30s work where it, it sort of, it's not just technology for the sake of it, it's a sort of modernity in a kind of more digested form that those sorts of polishes are being used. And it might be evocative of certain spiritualities, but it might be informed by other modern sculptors' use yeah. of it, and the way, the way that photography can, can the shine that can be captured through the black and white photographic image. Which is why I'm so interested in the kind of the readings of uh, Zadkin sculpture as an idol as well, and sort of even yeah. though it was sort of wooden, you know, the kind of, the kind of uh, ritualistic role that modern sculpture often seemed to take in this sort of period in which um, traditional, you know, religious attitudes were changing and, you know, a lot of, it, a lot of work has been done on um, uh, 
Petworth in relation to her sort of religious views sort of changing as she met Nicholson. Um, and that's something that I'm sure you could look into in relation to Moore as well. Yeah, th thank you. I, mean, I, just, I felt that across the first two papers, we were dealing with very different surfaces, with very, with very different metaphorical resonances. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of relation to the human body, so far when we were looking at photographs of Henry Moore in the 1920s and 30s, we haven't been looking at a, a Brancusian, Rodin-esque bearded man. We've been looking at a very close shaven. And there's something about the kind of, I mean, the famous Gouria Breschka line about even telling whoever it was that he shaved his beard off for the sake of pure form. There's something about the kind of correspondence of skin, surface, and st there's a, there's, anyway. Mm -hmm. any, any other comments or questions? Um, going more in movement, also thinking about um, those uh, those sculptures, um, that particular sculpture that Cathy showed, the kind of ones that showed the influence of um, Cubism and Vorticism. If you'd thought um, thought about that though, that work and how that might relate to movement as well. Yeah, I mean, so in relation to Dobson, he has like a very specifically Cubist period, which is a, which is a sort of 1918 to 1920, where he's kind of affiliated with Wyndham Lewis and his drawings, his sculpture is all, you know, very much kind of like post-First World War cubism. Um, I was really surprised to find those drawings in more, you know, and I was looking, you know, because I was looking at Frank Dobson, and so I looked at more for the purpose of this paper as a comparison, and, yeah, to sort of actually see the drawings that sort of develop from a more kind of cubist investigation of movement in space to something that's more... Um, surging, I suppose, and so the uh, more sculpture that you showed, the sort of upward turned face as well, and the sort of other ones in the space, they do have that kind of growth rather than a kind of movement. It's a different sort of interpretation of kineticism, I guess. Any more? Thank you, Inga. Thank, Thank you. you.